Every time we do a carburetor video, we get all these comments about the quadrajet. People either accuse me of not having any love for the thing, or they go the other way, and it's like, you know, the, the, the quadrabog, or the quadrajunk. But for the record, I love these carburetors. I know these carburetors. I've dealt with dozens of them over the years. And in fact, I've got one on my 1980 Dodge Wrecker. After Carter went tits up, Chrysler started using the quadrajet on all of its, you know, four barrel applications. And I wouldn't change it. For the, for the purpose, the carburetor is absolutely perfect. But you can't really talk about the quadrajet without also talking about the thermoquad. So, now here's how you, here's, you have to understand. The thermoquad was not a Chrysler carburetor. The thermoquad was introduced four years before Chrysler used it on the 1971 340 as a performance replacement for the quadrajet. Even the name thermoquad, and, okay, we'll get to that in a second. From a performance standpoint, the Quadrajet lacks in a few areas. You have to understand, it was primarily designed for use in the prestige cars. This is what they had in mind. The Buicks, the Cadillacs, you know, the big Oldsmobiles. They wanted a carburetor that gave good economy and also, you know, smooth, seamless transition, right? They wanted something that was, you know, silky smooth. And for that purpose, this carburetor is absolutely ideal. It's the best driving four barrel carburetor ever produced. But when it comes to performance, it has some limitations. And the biggest one has to do with the float bowl itself. Okay, so if you go to the 1966, 1967, 1968 era, when these things first started to come into performance use, they were known for having uh, heat soak issues. So what would happen was you'd make a run with the car, right? You get on it hard, and then you you know you'd stop, and it would start boiling fuel over into the into the engine itself. And that's because of the centrally located float ball. The centrally located float ball has two shortcomings. The first is that there's no way for it to dissipate heat. The the metal of the carburetor acts as a heat sink, and it just keeps raising the temperature of that gasoline until it boils. You know that Hollies all have their external mounted uh, fuel bowls. Carters, the, the AFBs, AVSs, Thermoquads, and even the Edelbrocks all have two float bowls and they're both to the outside edges of the carburetor where they're exposed to at least some airflow and they can get rid of some of the heat. In fact, that's where the name Thermoquad came from. The, the heat soak issue was so profound with these things in that 67, 68, 69 era that when they, when they designed the, uh, the, the replacement, the performance replacement for it, they called it a thermoquad specifically for that and the gimmick was the Philonic resin float bowl, so it's like, you know, super cool. Um, and of course, the two float bowls offer more capacity than the single in the, in the, in the Rochester. When you do run, a, run one of these in a performance application, uh, your, your fuel delivery system has to be really on point, like minimum 3 is fuel and you want to run the pressure at the needle in seat at the, that 7, 7.5 pounds as much as it will take before it blows off. And if you've got like a, a high performance you know, electric pump and you use an external regulator, you want to use a vacuum sensitive one so that you know, when the vacuum drops off it's just sending as much fuel as it can. These things are fantastic if stoplight to stoplight street racing is your game or you only run on 8th mile tracks they'll work great. But once you get out 800, 1,000 feet like that, they'll start to nose over and run out of fuel. So that's the key limitation with these things. It's that small centrally mounted, you know, centrally located float ball. They have a few other quirks or a few other things that make them difficult to work with. Um, like for instance, and it's, it's a small thing, but it adds up, right? The, uh, to make a, an idle mixture adjustment on this. The earliest ones had regular screws on them, but they were tiny and hard to get at. Um, then they went to this system where it, it takes a special tool that you got to get in there to, to you know, change the idle mixture. And then in the later years, they just sealed the whole thing off with, you know, with lead. Uh, the Carter, Carter went out of their way to make it easy. You don't even need a screwdriver. You could just, you know, uh, the, the fact that the, the idle mixture screw was unnerled, so all you do is just get in there with your fingers and, and make your adjustments like that. Um, the Rochester does have ex it does have a set of secondary metering rods which you can access externally, but to get at the primary metering rods, you've actually got to take the top of the carburetor off. 
So to make small jetting changes, you know, like on the run, you know, track side or, or even road side, you know, it's, you're not going to do that with, with the Rochester. Plus you don't have that, the assortment of drop rods the way you do with the Carter Edelbrock ones. So you can buy a strip kit for the Carter Edelbrock that'll have a, a whole assortment of drop rods so you can tailor it however you want. And you don't really have that luxury with the Rochester. You know, pretty much just what it is is, is what you got. Um, they do have a common defect, uh, and it affects just about 100% of these carburetors. And there's a simple fix for it. Um, when they manufactured these things, when they drilled the internal passages, what they did was they filled the holes afterwards with lead. So when it's new, that lead made a great seal. But after you know a couple hundred heating and cooling cycles, that lead would start to lose its grip. And what would happen is at idle, there'd be enough you know, vacuum there to start pulling fuel past the well plugs. Uh, and then you know, when they get really bad, they'll just drip until it'll empty the float bowl when the car is sitting. So the easy fix for that is just to pop the, bat the bottom of the carburetor off. Um, if, you, if you clean this area really good, like you know, with sandpaper or an emery cloth, uh, and then lay some epoxy, like a JV weld over it, let it set up, that's the easy fix for this. But if you've got one of these, and you can't get a clean idle mixture adjustment out of it, or like it loads up or floods it, and uh, or loads up and, 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 and fouls plugs at idle, that's probably where the problem is. But again, see, I have, I have all the respect in the world for these carburetors. You know, I love the things, I use them myself, but when it comes to, you know, real performance application, I, I generally tend to, you know, ignore these. You know, not to say that if you got one or if you love it, you can't make it work. There's guys that run these things in the stock eliminator and, and super stock, and they they, they run really fast with them. But they take more time, attention, and expertise than the other more common Carter and Holland carburetors. So and that's it. I figured I just you know wanted to let you guys know I, I I I do recognize that these carburetors exist. See you tomorrow. Okay. Alright.